us here, Professor Maria Dainowski, who just arrived uh, yesterday, uh, originally from uh, Roma, but uh, she works in Tokyo, uh, National Astronomical Observatory. Uh, she is assistant professor there uh, since three, four years. Uh, but uh, she did her PhD in the University of Roma La Sapienza 2008. Uh, she also has a habilitation degree, which she did in Poland, in Kraków uh, Jagiellonian University, 2019. Mm. She has been a fellow of the Japanese Society for Promotion of Science. Uh, she was uh, having a Fulbright uh, Fellowship and also Marie Curie Fellowship, both. Both of them, uh, she spent in uh, Stanford uh, University in the United States, and she's a, a member of American Astronomical Society and affiliated member of the Fermilab collaboration. Uh, this is a satellite devoted to observations of gamma ray bursts. And Maria is a, a well-known specialist uh, of the gamma ray burst astrophysics uh, and also. A statistical methods that overcome selection biases in astronomical data, namely the machine learning technology. Uh, she's uh, awardee of uh, multiple prizes. She received the Knecht Book of the Italian Republic and the um, Presidential uh, Award of the Italian Republic, uh, which promotes uh, women in science. And uh, she's recognized uh, as the fellow of the city of Cava del Tireni, the home city in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I will not prolong this conversation. Just turn no. on the light and welcome Maria. Yeah. Thank you so much, Agnieszka, for the very nice presentation. It is uh, very nice for me to be here. <laughs> To, to, to tell you about uh, gamma ray bursts as cosmological tools uh, together with other cosmological probes. So I would like to start with a, a brief introduction about what are gamma ray bursts. Gamma ray bursts are the most explosive phenomena in the universe after the Big Bang. Uh, they are flashes of high energy photons in the sky. Their typical duration is few seconds. Actually, they emit in few seconds, the same amount of energy that our sun releases in its entire lifetime. And their cosmological origin has been accepted long ago in 1997 with the observation of the GRB 970228 in which the redshift was determined. Before that, there was a lot of discussion whether GRBs are of galactic origin or cosmological origin. And uh, they, uh, the main event, which is uh, the front emission, that it has the typical um, uh, spike and then the exponential decay. Then in 60% of cases, we have this region that it is called the plateau emission. And uh, I would like to point out the attention of this because the plateau emission is one of the regions I've been studying for, for almost two decades. And then we have the afterglow phase. Uh, that starts uh, uh, immediately when we have these cases after the plateau region. So these uh, uh, features are very uh, important because then we can use these uh, uh, features to uh, use gamma ray burst as a cosmological standard candle. Of course, there are many problems to make them standard candle, and I will tell you a bit more about, uh, about those. And also, I would like to point out this, uh, uh, the... Uh, Blue line, that it is the uh, fitting line for the Willing SR 2007 model. This is a phenomenological model. Probably uh, you have uh, heard also that in the GRB community, usually people fit with the broken power law, but basically you can use different, uh, different functions. And now this is the, the main event. Then as I, I said that uh, the counterpart can happen actually, the main event is in uh, high energy gamma rays or hard. Um, are the X-rays, but can happen also in optical emission. And uh, the uh, counterpart is in X-ray, optical, and radio emission sometimes. That can be observed in, uh, in days or even after um, many weeks or months from the main prompt emission event. 
Now, having said that, we would like to also uh, dig a little bit more in the classification. So now, why the classification of gamma ray bursts is so important for us? Because if our aim is to use gamma ray bursts as standard candle or standard disabled candle, we need to make sure that we are using an homogeneous set of GRB. So we are not mixing properties of gamma ray burst and because properties of gamma ray burst can reconduct back to what it is the emission mechanism, what it is the progenitor of, of gamma ray burst. Then we have the short uh, GRB that are harder in the spectrum. So short it means that they're T90, so the uh, time in which 90% of the uh, energy in the prompt emission, it is emitted between 5 and 95% of the total count subtracted the background is less than two seconds, while the long gamma ray bursts are greater than two seconds. But this classification, it is a traditional classification and has been challenged over the years since uh, Norris and Bonnell 2006, in which they started to question whether the T90 should be placed at two seconds or it should be actually at greater uh, greater time. And there was also a paper by Bromberg, Bromberg South 2013 in which actually we have mixed property and the T90, it is placed at 0 0.8 seconds. Now, the uh, short GLBs are believed to be compact object measures, so it's a neutron star, neutron star, or neutron star black hole, and the long gamma reverse, which have softer spectrum, then they are believed to be created by core collapse of massive stars, so um, um, stars that have uh, masses greater than 20 solar masses. But actually, I would like to anticipate something here, is that um, uh, this classification also about the subcontract of the merger and the core collapse of massive stars is actually not, not also like finalized, because uh, recently uh, with the uh, with, uh, colleague from Stanford University, Professor Petrosa, we actually claimed that the low redshift GRBs, they may have the same progenitor, and they are both uh, driven by the uh, black hole uh, neutron star merger or neutron star neutron star merger due to the uh, identification of this uh, new long gamma reverse associated with the kilonova. So even at this uh, progenitor system sketch, uh, it's even not, uh, not finalized because we have more and more observation. So this makes even harder and harder to make gamma reverse standard disabled candle. Then it would be nice to ask ourselves why we can rely on gamma reverse as possible cosmological mm -hmm. for a series of reasons, because they can be probes of the early evolution of the universe. In fact, they are observed up to redshift 9.4, but according to studies, uh, Lambert al. 2000 uh, and 2022, in principle, they can observe because they are free from dust extinction even at higher redshift. And then uh, they are observed beyond the epoch of reionization. The, the end of the epoch of reionization is usually set at redshift 6, but it is also an uncertain uh, um, uh, redshift, and uh, they allow to investigate the population three stars, which are the most ancient stars. They allow to track the star formation, and the uh, beauty of using gamma ray bursts is that actually there's, they are much more distant than supernova 1a. Actually, the most distant supernova 1a is up to redshift 2.20 six so far, and the quantas are discovered, have been discovered up to redshift 7.54. Uh, therefore, we could go even beyond quasars. But there is a huge problem with the gamma ray bursts, is that they don't seem to be standard candle because their isotropic luminosities and energies span over eight order of magnitudes. So it is really very challenging to um, make them standard candle. And, this is not only a problem for making them standard candle, but also this widespread of luminosity and fluxes, actually, and properties is also very much a challenge for the machine learning analysis that I will tell you very briefly in this talk today. And one point here that it is also a painstaking issue, bottleneck in, in our field, is that we have few redshift measures. And we, for population studies, actually we need many more 
redshift of GRB. So if we consider uh, the uh, number of GRBs uh, observed with redshift is uh, only about eight, nine percent if we consider the whole population also of the Fermi GRBs. But of course, the majority of uh, redshift that we can measure, it's, from, it's coming from ground-based, not even from the SWIFT uh, satellite. So majority of the GRBs, they follow the SWIFT alert the ground-based telescope, and then we managed to, to measure. So the majority of GRBs with redshift are the ones that come from SWIFT. That's why SWIFT, uh, it's uh, one of the, of the main uh, sources uh, for which we, we, can, we can use for standardizing GRBs. So now the question is, what can we learn from gamma ray bursts? So because they are observed high redshift, we can then investigate the dark matter content, which is 26.8%, uh, and then the arc, dark energy content, which is said to be today 68.3%. So we can explore several models. Uh, usually uh, in uh, the cosmological approach, what we do is that we uh, check consistency with the lambda CDN model, with the core dark matter model. Uh, but we can also uh, uh, check not only, as I said, the uh, dark matter content or the, the energy density content, but also we can check the equation of state, the W parameter, either what it is its value if we consider a constant value or if it is a function of the redshift. And then um, one important thing is that there is nowadays a very huge debate about this Hubble uh, constant value. Uh, so uh, because there is discrepancy between uh, the values that we have for the local universe with the Stephanie and supernova, uh, around 74.5, and then the values that we have with CMB, that it is uh, 67.5. So this is uh, more than a three sigma discrepancy. Actually, it arrives even at 6.4 discrepancy if you consider different uh, uh, data samples. So then, because gamma ray bursts are in, uh, in a redshift that it is uh, much higher than supernova, of course, much smaller than the CMB, uh, the, the data of Planck, then we could see, uh, together also with the quasar, we could see what happens at the, this cosmological parameter in this range of redshift, that which otherwise the universe will be um, uh, unexplored about those uh, uh, those values, those uh, those ranges. And um, now the problem is that which relationship, which quantities we could use for for making GRB standard candles. So first of all, I would like to present this uh, uh, again some 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 analysis of the plateau emission also in uh, in optical. So as I said, some some cases of optical. Uh, they also have this uh, front emission. So the, the, this optical and X-ray data, they share similar feature, and this is the, uh, the standardization is good. So I was a previous week in a conference in China, there was a lot of discussion about whether or not as a community of, of GRB people, we should uh, follow up peculiar event, or we should actually also mind about uh, what are the general properties of the regular gamma rivers. And the discussion was uh, mixed in the sense that uh, uh, because initially the SWIFT satellite was observing 46% of follow-up of all GRBs, now actually it is down to only 8% for the follow-up of GRBs, then majority is also uh, given for, uh, for uh, uh, AGN and other, uh, other interesting event of, of time of observation for follow-up. So in the end, the community somehow discussed in, in panel, okay, we should follow up this uh, very peculiar GRBs, but we should also pay an attention to these regular events because they are the regular events that then make this population study possible. It's not the peculiar GRB or, or the, uh, you know, the strange event. Now, having said that, what it is the standard set of gamma reverse to be used? Because we already saw that there are some classes, but the situation is not finished yet. Actually, the situation is even more complex than that because we have these X-ray flashes that have this X-ray fluence over gamma ray fluence greater than one, then we have the GRBs associated with supernovae for which the supernovae has been safely seen. Then we have this shot with extended emission that I mentioned uh, earlier for which you know the time is not two seconds, it's greater than that, but they are mixed between 
they are harder in the spectrum. Then we have this very long gamma ray burst with T9 greater than five, 500 seconds, ultra long greater than 1000. And then all these classes have been categorized in type one, type two, type one, uh, they have duration less than two seconds. They have low star formation, no supernova associated, and they have this natal kick. While the type two are long in, uh, in the duration, they have alpha formation and associated with supernova and non-natal kick. Now, the point is, the, the main question is the following. Can we use one of these classes directly to be used as standard candle? The answer, unfortunately, is not. We cannot use this. So we need to do additional more work, not only in the classification, but also is in understanding how, how to do that. And the work that I've been doing since my since the end of the PhD is to uh, find the correlation between the properties at the end of the plateau emission and the time rest frame at the plateau emission. This is, this is an anti-correlation. So it means that more luminous it is the plateau emission, shorter it is its duration. So the energy reservoir of the plateau emission remains constant. And we have also corrected for, for, for biases. Uh, that's why I moved to Stanford University because I could learn more and master this, uh, this study about selection biases. And then we extended this relationship in 2D to the three dimension. So we added the peak prompt luminosity. So this correlation becomes a three dimensional correlation. And again, this uh, three dimensional correlation is unbiased. So it means that it has been corrected for selection biases and redshift evolution. So now, Going just one moment, a step back. Why it is so important to correct this correlation for selection biases and redshift evolution? Because in principle, if you take parameters of important parameters of a GLDs and they correlate each other. However, this correlation can come from the fact that in the rest frame, quantity are related to redshift. And also you have the so-called Malmquist bias effect for which you only see the brightest object. The farthest object uh, uh, that are seen are also the brightest ones. So you are also missing a very dim population of gamma reverse at low redshift. Because of that, you can create artificial correlation, which are not induced by intrinsic physics, but are just induced by this, uh, this selection biases. And if you use this correlation that are let's say fake correlation, you can make mistakes in, in the as, um, assumption or in, in cosmological derivation. So the parameters of cosmology that you can derive, if the correlation is not grounded to intrinsic physics, can, be also, can also lead to bias. And we demonstrated in 2013 that actually, if you mismatch the intrinsic group of the correlation, you have a bias of usually 10% in the omega n and the H0 cosmological parameters. And also we extend this uh, relationship in two and in, in, in radio and optical. So this, this relationship actually it has been extended in, in several wavelengths. Now, uh, going back to the, to the problem, uh, why we need to uh, distinguish among the several classes, you can see from this, uh, from this plane that the short, the X-ray flashes uh, and the GRD supernovae, besides the long gamma ray bursts that are this uh, um, uh, filled in, black dot, they are closer to the plane. So if we start to use one defined category of GRBs, we can already see that the scatter from the plane becomes smaller. Now, why it is so important that the scatter is smaller? The scatter must be as small as possible because then the scatter plays a role in the determination of cosmological parameters. And I will show you in a, next, uh, in a couple of next slides why it is so important, not only the number of sources, but also the scatter. And then we could reduce this, uh, this, uh, this scatter, uh, choosing this, uh, these classes. But also, we need to make sure that the properties of the, of the plateau emission are well defined. Uh, actually, we, uh, we settled that the first few data points of the, of the plateau emission must be, uh, must be very well determined. So at least five data points in the plateau. Then the flatness, uh, we should not have like um, an angle that it is greater than 41 degree. And uh, this defines this golden sample, but then we make some um, improvement to this, uh, to this golden sample. And 
Then we have these uh, cases of uh, in high energy, this is the Fermi last gamma ray burst, and actually with Anjerka and Joseph, we are working especially on this GRB 090510 to understand the properties of, uh, of the outflow, the, the, the jet and the, uh, the mass accretion, the spin. So it is work on the prompt emission properties, but because this is one, one peculiar, uh, peculiar GRB. And uh, then we took these uh, three GRB that have also the indication of the plateau emission in high energy, and we could see that actually they follow this, uh, this relationship. Uh, so they follow the, the Dynoxy relation, and this, uh, we started this investigation actually in the collaboration of the catalog, and then there was a spin-off data that then was published in 2021. So one property here is that they have a smaller duration compared to the larger duration of GRBs that are observed in, uh, in other wavelengths. So you can see that in according to the wavelengths, you can have, uh, according to the properties of the wavelengths, you can have uh, placement of this uh, of these uh, data points in different uh, uh, place in this uh, in this plane, but now um, we I would like to to mention something about this uh, um, optical analysis. So we did this. This is on the on the right hand side. We see that this uh, this is the fundamental plane uh, without correction for correct for selection biases, and on the right hand side there are there is the correction for selection biases here. We can see that, and this this Gaussian distribution, it is the distance of the data of the golden sample from the gold fundamental plane. These other Gaussian distribution are according to the other classes. So, why did we investigate that? Because in X-rays, actually, we could see that short gamma ray burst and long gamma ray burst actually they have a difference in these distances. So it means that if you um, if you see the placement of the GRBs on the plane, you can also infer some properties on the on the uh, classes they they belong to. So, for example, you have some GRBs for which you don't know which class they belong. Then maybe you place on the plane, and then you mm -hmm. see the distance from the plane, and then you can infer that. But can I ask one yes, question? Yes, yes, of course. So first, you rather look for the outlier and then uh, uh, it is uh, justified to remove it by classification or so, or you use first the classification and then you remove those stocks. So I use the class. It's not obvious. I mean, if you use, if you, if you remove outlier, then it's kind of uh, no, but in fact, I have. Yes, yes, no, but in fact, I don't remove any outliers. So, what I do is that I, uh, uh, I'm saying that this plane, uh, you build this plane with all classes of gamma ray bursts. Then you restrict to one class of gamma ray burst, which is the long gamma ray burst. And then when you restrict to this, long gamma ray burst, you will have another plane with slightly different parameters of the plane. So then let's say you have another GRB, you put this GRB on your plane, let's say you don't know which class this GRB belong, then you make the, uh, the Gaussian distribution of all the classes that are already certain, and then you can measure this GRB to the distance of the, of the several planes, and you can check what it is the closest to which plane it is the closest, because each of these category identify one plane, and this is the distribution of the plane. But what I wanted to convey is that while in X-rays we can actually use this uh, fundamental plane for discrimination among classes, if you do the, the optical, this is not so obvious anymore, and actually you can you cannot do that. So again, in the conference, there was a discussion. We could use this uh, relationship for discrimination among the, among the classes. But then another important point is that we should always be mindful of being sure first of the classification, because I completely agree, I don't remove outliers unless there is some physical reason for which uh, this must be done. So this is to say that the situation is more clear in X-ray than optical. We need to investigate why in optical, this is not the case, maybe because we have less data points, maybe because uh, the, the plateau in optical is less, uh, less defined, so this is still an open question. And now when we go to the, to the radio correlation,
correlation, then we can see as we also consider all the correlation together, optical X-ray radio, you see that where they are where they are not corrected, when they are not corrected with selection biases, actually you have this uh, sloping radio that seems much different from the other. But when you consider this uh, uh, correction with selection biases, you can see that although the error bars are larger because you propagate also for the correction for for evolution, actually these are uh, um, these slopes are compatible with into sigma. So again, this is important for assessing for cosmological purposes. And I mentioned about uh, going uh, uh, towards the refinement of, of a sample. And here we have this, uh, uh, this actually platinum sample for which besides the other classes that I already mentioned, I mean the other uh, classification that I mentioned, we have that the time should be should not be inside a large gap of data and actually we uh, we work on this uh, uh, for the light for reconstruction then we should skip the small plateau duration that has maybe gaps after it because it can be that that plateau can be even longer so maybe the uh, onset or, or the, the final end time of the plateau is not well determined and there are flares and bounds but if there are flares and bounds at the start and during the plateau maybe it's not good so if you do this additional cleaning of the sample, you can further reduce this capture of additional 31%. Because again, the goal was to try to reduce as much as possible this capture. And now going to the physics of, of the of the GRDs, then I think we can actually see that this uh, we have this internal plateau that are defined to a very steep decay uh, with alpha after the slope less greater than three or even. Uh, uh, for the year 2018, or even greater than four for lions, and indicate the internal origin of the plateau related to the magnetar. So we have several kilonovae that have been associated with short gamma ray bursts, and these cases are presented in these literatures. Now, if we consider this new platinum sample and we apply a correction or selection bias, we see the new intrinsic scatter. So at this point, we can say that this is the smallest intrinsic scatter so far for the GRD relations that we have in the literature. And I will tell you in a moment why this is really important. But also going to the, uh, what it is uh, showing here is that we have GRBs with, uh, these are all GRBs with plateau in the fundamental plane. These are the one associated with the, with the kilonovel. So the ones associated with the kilonovel Actually, these are the, uh, the yellow uh, truncated uh, icosahedrons, and these are below the brain. But if you consider even the short GRDs and short GRDs with kilonovel, actually, these are even below the plane of the short GRD. So we need to understand why it's not clear, because when we apply the methods for correction and selection bias, uh, um, they are not driven by other, uh, by other biases. So this is something that must be still investigated. And now, uh, back to my first point is that uh, we need to have physical grounding. We need to be sure that this is not uh, uh, just uh, uh, variables that are correlated together, but there is no physical grounding. And uh, the prompt emission properties are, are really complicated, while the afterglow are more easy to, to understand. If we consider the magnetism, so this is a fast uh, uh, spinning neutron star, then uh, the, uh, we can explain the plateau emission with the spin down luminosity of the magnetar entirely pinned with a given jet of emitting angle. Now we can see that the long gamma ray bursts are placed at the smaller value of the uh, magnetic field and the spin pickup, while the short gamma ray bursts are placed in this upper region. Of course, there may be outliers. So if, you, if we apply a statistical test of the Kolmogorov's mirror, these are two different populations. So this is again going towards the direction that when we have the plane and we measure these distances from the plane, we see this difference between short and long in the X-rays, then we see this difference also in the magnetic field and spin field of the magnetar. Now, then there is also previous literature about, about the magnetar, about analytical modeling, and, uh, and uh, I'm not mentioning all the most complicated analysis that I described on this, on this field is just this is a, a theoretical, just analytical modeling. And uh, if we want to think more about this, uh, this relationship, then uh, uh, we, I gather this uh, uh, 
consideration in uh, several in three um, three reviews, a series of review papers, and then uh, I collect this material in a book. I'm planning to expand this book, so if anyone is interested to join this uh, extension of the book from the possible, you know, interpretation, this is something that uh, I'm, I'm planning to do in, uh, in the near future. Now, after all this wide overview of these uh, challenges that we have with correlation, finally, we are at the step that we have two possibilities to apply this correlation uh, with two solutions. Uh, we have either the simultaneous fitting, so using the parameters of the correlation together with the cosmological models, because otherwise we would have the circularity problem. We cannot fix the parameter of cosmology mm -hmm. then the right cosmological parameters, so this is the so-called circularity problem. And then you have the calibration with low, low redshift probe, for example, I'm telling you uh, the cosmic chronometer. So given that the object the same redshift should have the same luminosity, uh, then regardless of the underlying cosmology, then we can use this for calibrators at, at high redshift. Now, if we combine the uh, GLB plus supernova plus bioacoustic oscillation, this is a paper that we published already last year, we could see that actually the parameters of the uh, omega and H0, they are um, aligned actually with the, uh, the parameters of the supernova one. And if, uh, uh, if uh, I mean, the, the point is that, okay, you recover the same uh, the same parameters of supernova. So what else can we do at this uh, at this point? So the point is that, uh, in my opinion, it is good to go one one step back and start to question the very fundamental statistical basis for the application of uh, of GFB cosmology, but also of supernova cosmology. Because in another paper, I will not have. Uh, Time to mention here, but what we found out is that uh, the Hubble constant actually is not, <laughs> if we divide in this, uh, actually there is a variation of H0 as a function of redshift. And because of that, we started to investigate whether this is uh, due to some modified theory of gravity or it could be some selection effect that we are playing here or, or something else. And then we uh, uh, we uh, started to question about the assumption of the likelihood. So common assumption in cosmology is the following. So we have Gaussian likelihood of the supernova via all quasars and G. So you take the distance luminosity from your relationship, any relationship that you have from supernova, from quasar or G. Then you subtract this distance luminosity to the distance luminosity theoretical. So you have your own cosmological model, you do this uh, subtraction, and then you assume that this distance corrected by the, uh, the, the uh, covariance matrix or the, or the uncertainty on the progress of the GMV, this is Gaussian. This is all assumption that all uh, community in cosmology uses, but there is a huge problem here because actually the questions are always valid. Only when we test gamma ray burst with this planning ensemble, this assumption of Gaussianity is valid. However, for supernova, via O and quasars, this is not valid. And what are the consequences on that? 10 minutes, okay. So then the consequences of that is that uh, basically when we have this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, non-normality, then we have that this, uh, uh, you see, this is the, uh, with the green is the normal distribution, with the red is the logistic distribution, and the logistic distribution for the Panther sample, which is a collection of 1048 supernova, works better. For this Panther class, this is 1701 supernova, the T student distribution works better, and even between Panther and Panther class, you have a difference in this distribution, so this distribution, are heavy, they have heavy tails. And this uh, distribution are normalized with this uh, uh, you know, uh, covariance matrix. So we should apply this uh, not Gaussianity assumption. Now, uh, you may remember that a few moments ago, I told you that it is important to discover because 
this is a scatter of uh, uh, this is the variance. So variance is related to the scale factor. This is a logistic distribution of EUs, Gaussian distribution of EUs that just the the uh, the, uh, the sigma of the of the uh, of the Gaussian. Anyway, this is uh, the uh, uh, the denominator of the exponential. So it is way more than the number of sources. So that's why it's so important and beyond you know between new instruments increasing the sample also to have precise measurement. And then uh, uh, if we consider this uh, student and the Gaussian distribution, we see that the H0 value is much more constrained. So we are really going uh, uh, farther in the reduction of the scatter, 43% on omega m and 41% on h0 respectively. If we can use the logistic distribution to the t student is 42% and 33% for, for omega m. So according to the to the function class. Now what did we do later? So we added all the props together because this is the work that we did for supernova. Then we added the GLP, we added the quasars and PO, and this is what it is happening regarding this uh, uh, no evolution means you are not correcting the, any evolution selection bias. Fixed evolution, you are, you are using this uh, correction, but you fix a cosmological model. And variegated evolution is the one that uh, it is the most uh, appropriate one. Then uh, this is uh, um, you are varying the cosmological model together with this correction. So this is the, these are the results that we see. And we see um, that we have among all the problems. So we can check that actually the scatter, when we consider this uh, um, this new likelihood that this is the LN is the new likelihood and this are the Gaussian likelihood. Actually, we have reduced the scatter as I already mentioned. So, in this table, we have this uh, delta variation. So, you can see this is all negative. So, it means that you have all reduction of the scatter uh, in all several configuration, even with phantom and phantom plus. So, the next question okay, did we solve the Hubble concentration with this? Actually, we, with this result, we are more prone to say that we go toward the supernova function. So we are closer to the supernova 1A values for the for the Hubble constant instead of the of the Planck measurement. And we have reduced the scatter, but because we have reduced the scatter further, then the tension between the C and D and the supernova, I mean this result grows. But we can say that we are more leaning who are the results of the supernova line. Now, uh, I mentioned that uh, um, we want to also do calibration, the second method, not leaving all the variables to do it. And if we do the calibration with the 2D and 3D relationship of the cosmic chronometer, we can still recover this in in uh, sigma intrinsic scatter very small. So this is compatible with the previous analysis of the common academy without applying it. Any cosmological analysis, so this is very impressive because basically they uh, overlap within one sigma. And if we consider this uh, uh, relationship, other relationship, the Amati relation and the Lyonetov relation, you can see that they depend on the sample size and the scatter, depend on the sample size, it's around 0 0.20, but they reach up to 0 0.55. So this poses this relationship to be uh, the most promising one for the application of cosmology, not only for the intrinsic physics, but also in terms of the scatter. And then what else can we do? Now we need new maybe relationship, I don't know, but definitely we want to tighten up more the relationship. We need to increase the sample. We can have a cosmology, cosmology independent approach via low redshift. We can fine tune the physical interpretation so we can still match the connection between the quest between theory and the standard set. And now how? How can we do that? So there were forecasts that uh, it is a couple of years ago that we need, you know, around 1,500 GLBs if we use this optical relationship and we, we have the error bar that we actually see them. But some of the error bars of these relationships are out of you know, you have two distribution of error. I mean, you have a distribution of error. Some of them are half of the others. If we use half of them, then you can um, go around, you know, 1,000 GRBs to get very small value of the omega n parameters. So now the takeaway of all the simulation, and uh, you can point out this big table that we have in this, in this table, is that 
uh, uh, we have reached this uh, uh, precision of uh, that's super knowledge 10 years ago, more, more than a decade ago, already two years ago. But we need to use machine learning analysis, and this is a work that we have been doing with, uh, with Aditya, is now present, and uh, Anishka Polo. Uh, we, uh, we actually uh, succeeded in uh, deriving the redshift of uh, gamma ray burst. So, deriving the redshift of gamma ray burst actually it allows us to increase the sample by double. Then we can have, with the light for reconstruction, and greater precision of the parameters at the end of the plateau. And with this greater precision, pre precision plus larger sample, we, could, uh, we already reached this value of only here. And so just uh, in uh, two years, we can reach the same value of Petule 2014, so uh, this precision alone again. But the problem is that if we want to reach the precision of supernova, then we would need to wait 18 years, but it's more enough because we don't really need to wait so many years because, first of all, there are uh, Einstein probe data that this uh, kind of uh, analysis must be added yet to the computation. And what we are, we are doing is to try to understand more and more about the physics, and we can, uh, we can definitely fine tune this, uh, this result. So now I would like to tell you why. Um, it is important to use this, uh, uh, because we have seen in the literature sometimes people use this uh, relationship to fair edge, then they use the edge to apply for cosmology. But this is circular problem, because then this parameter, uh, they depend on cosmology. Because you see, if we derive the redshift, we should stop there. We can derive the redshift from this relationship, but then there is another issue here that for small variation, of the luminosity, you have very large variations. So at the small variation, this luminosity correlation, you see that there is large variation that you can have of the redshift inferred. And this problem actually does not happen for the, for the machine learning analysis. And this is the reconstruction with, uh, with uh, the, uh, the uh, light for the blood emission. So you can populate all this, and then you can definitely Obtain better, better parameters is an ongoing effort. Now, we tried also to the theoretical modeling uh, to use the closure relationship, but this was not really help, helpful too much to, to reduce the scatter of the relationship. And here it is the series of paper that we, we publish on the redshift inference. And this is actually a nice one that was just accepted a week ago. A um, couple of weeks ago, and we had press release from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and also a Facebook post, and also the Babylonian University workshop, uh, University, and uh, uh, the Slope and I took the, the news, and we are, we are working on these uh, press releases. So now, uh, if I have still a couple of minutes, or maybe I already exceeded the uh, okay. couple of minutes, so I would like to uh, uh, tell that there is also. For the future, we can extend the distance ladder with the cosmic chronometer, and so we can color up to high redshift, so that we can combine GLBs with other probe and treat similarly also the quasar. So um, we have been working on the quasar standardization because we believe that it is important to, do when you combine the probes together, actually you need to consider. A similar setup. So we try to clean up the sample for quasar and we reach the same precision of supernova 1A. We did this in this set of three papers. And so, what the story of GLB cosmology actually does not end here. This is just actually the very beginning. And we are, uh, we are building actually the largest optical catalog to date, also with the the help and support of the data from uh, uh, NUJ Subaru Telescope. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, this is under submission, it's almost my minor comments, but, and uh, it's going to be public. So if anyone would like to use uh, uh, the one that is accepted, we are going to release the data together with our web scraper. So anyone would like to dig into the optical data, then it's a great uh, for, for usage, and of course, uh, uh, you would be able to then cite this, uh, this paper. Then we can improve this prediction with light for reconstruction and we can still uh, improve this, uh, this theoretical discussion. Basically, how many GLBs we could, for example, a given parameter case of Monday and Carol Modernity, but then we could use those to, uh, to predict 
the uh, I mean to, to a standard problem. And uh, I think I will not have too much time to, to go into the details of this, but uh, the results of this uh, this three set of paper that I told is that the omega n value is slightly smaller than with this set of 983 quasars is slightly smaller than the value that you would obtain from supernova 1a. And uh, here we see that uh, nicely you have two minima basically. You have one minima around 0, uh, 0,28, and you have another minima very small that is compatible even with the quasi detector universe. And we investigated this also with the uh, FOR theory of gravity. Then we started to investigate other uh, um, methodology to pinpoint the sample. So again, we shrink the sample at a similar value, around you know, 951,000 sample. We reduce the scatter of the relationship, and again, we stay at a precision that is very small. So the precision, I mean, size of the error on the omega n is very, is very small. So we could use quasars as standalone group in this, in this regard. And this is the omega n value that has been, been released with, with the quasars only. Now, if we change again this, uh, I will not get into the detail of this method, the statistical method, this case that regress are taken to. You have the sample, then you start to fit again, and you discard the outliers of the sample to the statistical mean, you reach an, again another subsample of results with very, very high precision on, on, on the guy. And this is, this is called the sigma flipping procedure. So you can see that it's for a smaller number of sources. Uh, you have this smaller value on the omega n parameter, and if you have larger number of sources, this is going to, to increase. And as I said, because there is this value of omega n that is not actually fixed, but it's variable, then we, we actually explain this with the FOBAR theory of, of gravity. Now, uh, as I said, the, st the story continues, so please stay tuned. And I would like just to make final uh, final announcement that there is a parallel session on GLP correlation with radiation technology. So if anyone is interested to join this meeting, uh, then and also on the machine learning and AI, uh, you can submit your code by 31 of May. Uh, and then also there is a call for abstract in galaxies with special issue, gamma reverse in the valence theory, observation correlation, GLP cosmology. So, we are gathering the submission until the 30th of September, so if you are interested, you also in submitting this. Um, and for young people, if they want to apply for GSTS uh, for Japan, there is now the internal deadline when the is open and the deadline is first of all. So thank you so much for the attention. Thank you Mariana, please. Uh, thank you for the talk. I, I see that you work with some of the colleagues here. So yes. I, I'm, I'm glad to see. I, I have a lot of questions, but perhaps one of them is at some point you mentioned that you get different age and values if you leave your data. Right? Yes. And I, I was curious about what you think of yes. the yearly data or the Pantheon data or which data. So, so the Pantheon data, so maybe I can, although um, that it was uh, not my main topic, but I can go to this. Uh, Part the slide and maybe I can show you something if I have it here. So basically, we are we are getting evolution of uh, of the which yes, okay, I think. Um, I don't know if I have in this uh, in this presentation. Yes. Okay. So here uh, the. Uh, we have the uh, you know theory versus the data. You have this uh, distance model you observed, and then you have this uh, Philip relation that it has been extended with the color. Then you have the theoretical uh, distance model, and then you minimize this uh, chi square. Now, if you do this, this is for Pantheon. We did for Pantheon. Now, if you do this in a several redshift bin, you don't obtain a value of h zero that is constant, but it is decreasing. So. Yes, this is the, the result. So basically, if you use the lambda TDM model, and we started at 73.5, so the M parameter, because it is degenerate with the H0, you shift this uh, at, at a given value of M. So you start your H0, 
And if you consider this, here we did with three bins, with four bins, but we also did with the 20 and 40 bins to make sure that this procedure is not affected by the number of redshift bins that you have. And then uh, you can actually uh, mimic this uh, evolution with, uh, with a simple function. So you have, let's say, H0 tilde divided by 1 plus Z to a given alpha. If alpha is 0, it means that there is constancy. But is alpha, if alpha is different from 0 in a given sigma interval, and this is like up to 2.1 sigma, then it means that there is some evolution. And the question that I mentioned, that I said, that this is like just selection biases that have not been accounted for, or there is uh, intrinsic physics with the f of r theory of gravity that plays a role. And actually, we, we gave like, how to say, amplitude of interpretation. So we said that this can happen both ways. And you see, this is also happening not only in the lambda CDM model, but also in W0, WR. So basically, this is regardless of the model that you are considering. Here you have this alpha parameter that is, uh, of course, in frequency with the number of bins, but this is uh, uh, actually different from Z. And here we have the table. Uh, here you can see that actually the nice thing is that to recover this uh, one idea that we had to reconcile with the Hubble constant, uh, you know, tension was that let's say we continue to extrapolate this alpha value until the redshift of uh, the CMB, so until 1,100. If you do that, actually nicely, you could recover this value of uh, at 1,100. You could recover, of course, with large error bars, but you could recover the value of the, of the CMB. The problem here that I see in this, in this, uh, um, this consistent analysis by itself on the supernova, but when you do analyze the gamma reverse that are at red, up to redshift nine, then you alone, then you get some higher value of, of H0. However, if you consider gamma reverse alone, uh, you, you have also larger value of the scatter, which may be also compatible with this scenario. So that's why I insisted in my talk that we really need to reduce and reduce further this uh, uh, error bars on, uh, on the GRB, GRB analysis. So, um, th so the answer to the question is on, on the supernova, but we also did for BAO. And this is, uh, um, we did uh, uh, calibrating, uh, um, well, we did also with the covariance matrix. So if you may have seen some other works in the literature that they also did the statistical uh, distats, so the matrix for only statistical uh, errors, but we also included this uh, uh, systematics uncertainty. So it's the full, uh, the full matrix. And here we could see this uh, percentage of the tension. So you see this, this reduction of the tension, it is 55% up to 72% according to the bins. So we definitely have this reduction of scatter if we apply this. Uh, this kind of uh, uh, simple, uh, simple evolution. And if we consider also the, the BAO, actually you have this uh, trend that it is, uh, it is uh, even becoming more, more, uh, uh, more prominent with this uh, W0WA CDM model. So you have even at 5.7 and 5.8 level if you add BAO. Now, we are doing this also with the Pantheon Plus, but now our analysis, because meantime we discovered about this likelihood that are different. So we are repeating all this analysis also with different likelihood to check the differences uh, on this analysis and the new, new endeavor. And one more thing that I would like to, to add here is that one problem that we have with the supernova 1A is that the sample is also using the same supernova duplicated values from different catalogs. And we usually don't do this for, for GRBs. For GRBs, we have one unique entries for that particular GRB. And of course, you know, statistically it's possible because you say, okay, this is like a different instrument, different, maybe slightly different light curve. And, uh, and, uh, and then you can add as a sample. But on the other hand, for, from more from the ontological point of view, if you have one source, it is the entity of one GRB or one supernova, you should consider as one. So we are also considering to shrink the sample as the one entity for supernova. So this is now ongoing work. Okay, any more questions? Yeah, questions. Yeah. 
I have a feeling that the very end it all boils down to healthy statistics. And uh, as SWIFT uh, already is, has been active for more than expected, uh, and you mentioned at the very beginning the importance of having more uh, so-called usual GRB observations, not yes. regular ones. And it's very difficult in the scientific community to get funding for something which just should convince us that we understand instead of make a super great discovery. What are the prospects that uh, you will finally, I mean, astronomers, astrophysicists, will get finally uh, much better statistics of GRB say if you reach up to uh, redshift equal to nine so in each segment on the way you should have a few hundred perhaps yes so and that's not going to be easy to no it's not going to be easy but because there is also the mission of uh, of Theseus that it is on phase two so uh, uh, hopefully this time will get accepted so it means that we will have the uh, the possibility to observe many more grbs at higher redshift so basically in one year of Theseus, we observe the same number of grbs that swift would observe in a decade so it's much more powerful in this regard because uh, the, the scope of Theseus is the early universe so and you know epochal realization and also the application of cosmology then another point that i think uh, uh, i agree with you because it's it's hard to convince the community because you know it's now after like 50 years of discovery of GRB, people are looking for more for peculiar cases. But every time a mission actually starts, they are going to gather all this Einstein probe and the Zvom mission that actually I think it has been already launched like a few few days ago. Uh, then uh, no, sorry, it's going to be launched in, in a month or so. So then uh, um, they are going to gather as many data as possible and do a lot of follow-up observation because it's the beginning of, of the mission then probably you know once the mission becomes older they will they will follow up more more peculiar events but the good news about swift is that there is no uh, uh, at the moment there is no plan for, for re-entry so it is likely that it will, go, will be ongoing until uh, 2030 or 2032 so uh, until you know there is some some degradation of the orbit but uh, so far, so we can say that we have at least six, eight more years, or even you know, ten years more for for the Swift observation that has been very, very, very promising. And yes, I agree with you that I think in the end we should also work more on the statistical analysis because you know, with the light core reconstruction, also and this machine learning analysis, we can get more more GRBs. And of course, you know, we are we are part of the community, so if we if we um, let's say. Uh, ask for funding for these population studies and more people do that, then I think somehow also the satellite um, also uh, have to meet the needs of the community. So if if more 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 grants are, are for this population study, then I, I would say that then as we've started 46% of following all GLBs, then it can you know widen up again. But then it is us, the community, that decided they want to study more other sources and, and then the target shifted. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I have one fundamental question. Maybe, <laughs> yes. maybe uh, yeah, uh, it's to the introduction, but also in, in the call talk. Yeah, uh, you seem to assume this magnetar model is the one responsible for both classes, short and long GRBs, and uh, yeah, all the sources can be explained by magnetar. How important is this assumption? Because we know there is an uh, alternative. Yes, yes, no, actually, 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 uh, actually, because I didn't have uh, time also to, to, to dig more, but uh, actually you could also uh, 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 explain this with accretion onto the black hole. The, the point is that with the accretion onto black hole, you have that the, uh, the physics of the or relationship could be consistent with uh, the index of the, of the power minus 1.2. However, when you correct for selection bias, it's consistent with minus one. Because of that, uh, from the magnetar model, you can recover directly from the spin period and magnetic field is minus one uh, uh, um, slope. However, the, the point is that we know that also with, for the magnetar, it depends on if you are uh, um, 
assuming the collimated emission or the isotropic emission, and you can, you can have some blurs that actually they do not follow the magnetar modulants, they follow instead the other. So that's why I was insisting on this point because let's say if we have this uh, GRDs that follow this relationship according to the magnetar, but others they do not, then we could also have the explanation for the other according to the accretion onto black hole and then use other parameter regression. So I'm sorry I did not have the time okay. to, to, to explain that. Yes, that is just, uh, yes, but this is, uh, this is a crucial. Yes, thank you for your question. Okay, short question. Yes, a basic question about the plateau phase. Uh, yes. Not all Jervis observation has this plateau phase. But what is the uh, special characteristic of this uh, set of so, because you have this prolonged energy injection, uh, yes, I mean the energy is on lower value of energy, or some uh, lower limit. So, yes, you have, uh, for example, in the in, within the, the, the magnetar model, you have this uh, uh, threshold, it's up to 10 to the power of 52 erg in, in energy, but you can have also. I mean, if you consider like a large uh, radii and uh, and uh, uh, you could have actually up to 10 to the power of 53. So there is this limitation now going back to the question of Anishka. In fact, some GLDs with higher energy, you cannot explain within this scenario. And then uh, definitely you would, uh, you would need to think about this uh, question to work on. And, uh, yes. But thanks for the question. Uh, any questions on Zoom? Do we have some? Questions on Zoom people? No. Okay. All right. So thank you very much again.